quorum and I declare the meeting in session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation and is now home to many other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people across Turtle Island. I am Mi'kmaq Senator Brian Francis from Ebigwit, also known as Prince Edward Island, and I am the chair of the Committee on Indigenous Peoples. Before we begin, I'd like to ask our committee members in attendance to introduce themselves by stating their name and province or territory. We'll start on my left. Uh, thanks. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is David Arnott. I'm a senator from Saskatchewan. I live in Saskatoon, which is in the heart of Treaty 6 territory. Senator Patty Labucan benson I'm from Alberta, from Treaty 6 territory. It might not be the heart, but it's the soul of Treaty 6. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Yana Martin from British Columbia. Good evening, I'm Senator Hartley, Nancy Hartley from New Brunswick. Scott Tannis from Alberta. Karen Sorensen, Senator for Alberta, Treaty 7 territory in Ben. Margot Greenwood from British Columbia and from originally the best part of Treaty 6. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Coyle, and I'm not from Treaty 6. <laughs> I'm from Anaganish, Nova Scotia, right in the heart of Mi'kma'ki. Michelle Odette from Nitasnan, called Quebec also. Thank you. Thank you, Senators. So on tonight's panel from the First Nations Finance Authority, we will hear from Ernie Daniels, and he's the President and Chief Executive Officer, Steve Verna, Chief Operating Officer, and Jody Anderson, Director of Business Development. Well, Alan, thank you to all our witnesses for joining us today. Mr. Daniel will provide opening remarks of approximately five minutes, which will be followed by a question and answer session with the uh, Senators. So I'll now invite Mr. Daniels to begin his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the to members of the committee for inviting us to present to you on the broad topic of the federal government's legal, political, constitutional, and treaty obligations to Indigenous peoples. My name is Ernie Daniels, and I have the honor to serve as the President and CEO of the First Nations Finance Authority. With me is our Chief Operating Officer, Steve Berna, and our Director of Business Development, Jody Anderson. I also respectfully acknowledge that I'm on the beautiful and uh, unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin Nation territory. I know mo that most of the senators here are familiar with the FNFA, but for those of you that we have not had the pleasure of meeting, the FNFA is one of the institutions that was established under the First Nations Fiscal Management Act. This act received royal assent in 2005 and was proclaimed and enacted in 2006. A couple of further things I'd like to note the act was supported by all parties in Parliament, and we work hard to maintain this broad support. As well, and this is very important moving forward, the FNFA and our sister institutions were conceived by First Nations and remain governed by and accountable to First Nations. As we have often seen, the best solutions to the challenges facing Indigenous people and communities are those designed by Indigenous peoples. Government have an important role to play in facilit facilitating and supporting those solutions. To date, we have raised $2 billion to facilitate much needed infrastructure and social and economic development in member First Nations. Using Stats Canada's models, we estimate the investment has created 20,000 jobs in participating First Nations and neighboring communities. As, impref as impressive as this is, we believe that it's time to take our partnership with the federal government to a new level. We have two main challenges. The sheer scale of the need in First Nations and the hard limit we'll encounter as own source revenues aren't sufficient to close the infrastructure gap. To bring things back to the topic of tonight's meeting, and the federal government's responsibility towards Indigenous people, there are moral responsibilities related to the legacy of colonialism, <clears throat> generations of neglect and underinvestment that have left First Nation communities without the basics that most Canadians take for granted. Estimates vary on how much would be needed to bring our infrastructure up to the Canadian average. The Canadian Council for Public 
private partnerships is conservatively estimated $30 billion in 2016, which would be closer to $60 billion today after inflation. While the AFN working with the Indigenous Services Canada has recently produced a figure close to $350 billion. The current federal government has set a goal to close this infrastructure gap by 2030. It's 2023, which seems less realistic with, with every day that goes by. When we think about the challenge related to infrastructure alone, I don't think we can realistically expect any federal government, however committed to real reconciliation it might be, to achieve the scale of expenditure over a short period. That being the case, we need to look at innovative solutions. The FNFA, in partnership with our board and with the support of our member nations, is proposing that we think, is proposing what we think is workable, innovative solution that we call monetization. Essentially, this would involve the federal government identifying an annual appropriation that the FNFA could sec securitize in the capital markets, allowing us to raise a significant amount of capital in the short term, short term that could be invested in communities across Canada. Obviously, we need to test how such a relationship would work, which is why we, are <clears throat> we recommend the government to think of this as a pilot. A budgetary line item of $200 million a year for 20 years would allow us to raise roughly $3.6 billion immediately. This could be used to finance projects and developments today at today's prices. An important consideration as inflation eats away at the value of the infrastructure funds available through Indigenous services each year. Obviously, this isn't the magic bullet and it isn't going to solve the infrastructure gap overnight but it would be a new approach, one that's been developed by first, one that's developed by First Nations and driven by First Nations institution. And if successful, it's something that we can build on in partnership with the federal government. So what we're, what, what we're requesting tonight from the, from the Senate is if you could provide a letter of support from the committee to urge the federal government to support a budget ask of $200 million over the next few years to test as a pilot project the solution of monetizing government transfers to close the infrastructure gap. So, so I would look forward to any questions that you have and I really thank you for your time and thank you for inviting us here today to speak to you in this beautiful chamber. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daniels, and we'll now open the, the floor to questions from Senators, and I'll start on my left with my Deputy Chair. Thank you, Senator Francis. Uh, well, thank you for uh, that overview, uh, Mr. Daniels. Um, um, I'm very impressed with your organization, its, uh, its success, and uh, uh, certainly the federal government should not have any trouble investing in uh, the, your organization with the success you've already shown. I think a lot of your work fits under the rubric of reconciliation and also um, the federal government has to look at it from the point of view of the fiduciary relationship uh, and you're a conduit for that. <clears throat> uh, I don't think there'll be any trouble getting a letter of support from this committee. Uh, I, you know, uh, so that's covered off. <laughs> Do you have any specific asks in the letter that you would like to see which would help you with any of your discussions with the federal government and if so you know you, you provide those to us because we're quite happy to support your work just one question i don't mean it facetiously but uh, why did you pick the number of 200 million and i ask that because i i think the gap as you've identified is very very huge and that won't close the gap uh, but uh, you obviously picked a number that you think you could work with or that was reasonable in the circumstances or um, we'll be, you'll be able to make a significant uh, inroads working with First Nations um, with that amount of money. But I'd, I'd just be curious to know, like, would more money work better for you? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first part of uh, the question. Uh, I think the specific act would be to urge uh, the Minister of 
uh, CERNAC or ISC to be a sponsoring minister uh, to support this budget ask. Um, the number 200 million, uh, we, we, we also believe it's a low number. <clears throat> but since we were talking about a pilot and we thought that maybe this would be easier to get through uh, the government system uh, um, and get support of all, all uh, central agencies and uh, sponsoring departments, either ISC or, or CERNAC. So the 200 million, we thought with a pilot project, we can work out how this would work. And then as, as, as it, we know it will be successful, <clears throat> and as we get the success and we iron out all the kinks, then uh, we would request that the amounts get larger and larger each year as, as goes by. When we first started this, and I think Senator Tannis will remember that we, I talked about a billion dollars. Uh, ISC budget on uh, infrastructure is delivered two billion dollars right now a year. If we took a billion dollars of that, based on our ability to go and leverage this into the capital markets on, on our success that we've had to date, we could raise 25 to 26 billion dollars. And I thought that would be a good start. Then we're starting to make a difference. And so, uh, the, you know, I don't know, Mr. Bernard, you would like to ask, uh, answer a part of the... Uh... Yeah. S Senator, the number came from a bit of backwards research. When you want to raise money, the question is, what are investors willing to lend to you? Since this is a new area, it is Canada back, which is a strength. But if you're going to ask investors for a certain amount of money, you have to be within their comfort zone. Large central banks around the world can raise up to $5 billion at a time. Uh, province of Ontario raises $42 billion a year, but they spread it over 52 weeks of the year. In order for us to work within the comfort zone of investors, we have to be under the $5 billion mark because it is new and they will want to have a presentation, a comfort, an understanding of what it is. After you do the initial raising of the $3.6 billion supported by the $200 million, investors' comfort level will be achieved. You then can up the amount to go what, what Canada and the First Nations respectfully would like to achieve together. But $200 million is to start within their comfort zone. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, I, I really support what you're trying to do, and, and so does this committee, I'm sure. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a, qu a question here. I wonder if you, either of you or all three, could comment on how the approval of a pilot project on monetization would help to address not only the infrastructure gap but other socio-economic conditions on reserve. And I'm thinking, for example, about helping with employment or education gaps, whatever the case is. Good, good question. Um, <clears throat> just, just based on uh, what we've done to date with uh, First Nations' own source revenue. We estimate that there's 20,000 jobs have been created, so that's two billion dollars. So if we if we do the math and extend it, um, for example, 350 billion dollars. I, I can't imagine how many jobs that's. It's going to be a lot. And the the other thing is is the positive effect on the Canadian economy as a whole. Can you imagine GDP going up if 350 billion dollars in uh, infrastructure was uh, available for First Nations? Uh, to close this infrastructure gap, it would be enormous. It would be many more times than that investment. Uh, on, uh, so, so the government's investment would be really minuscule compared to what the impact would be. So right now, with the $2 billion that we have already uh, have uh, uh, access from the capital markets, we estimate that the, the impact on the economy is about $4 billion. So it's, it's almost, it, it would be enormous. Yeah. Yeah. If I could add to that, a very timely question, actually. Uh, a number of chiefs, some who are sitting behind me, uh, came to me, came with me and Jody to a meeting with Procurement Canada this morning. We talked about bonding insurance, which is the question, who will be able to bid to build the assets that are needed on reserves, and who has the capacity? Each chief stood up, told the story of what their needs are, but they were also told the story about the community members who have training in construction, who have training in electrical, who have training in plumbing, are waiting for jobs to show up. The enormity of infrastructure building 
would also be added to the enormity of the job creation within the communities that need the infrastructure. You would not only build infrastructure, you would build employment youth or, or youth for employment or employment for youth. You would also build training programs and you would also create wealth management. So when we talk about monetization, there's an asset, but think about how the asset goes from an idea through construction, through tendering, through employment, through finalization, hand over the keys. So it is an absolutely <coughs> imperative part of monetization that we'd create a huge change in communities and the youth that are coming up. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, Senator Coyle and then Senator Labacane Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our, our witnesses and welcome back, uh, Mr. Daniels. Um, you, you know, what you're describing is uh, what uh, uh, a well-known Canadian, uh, Frank McKenna from uh, my colleague's uh, province from New Brunswick, would call a force multiplier. Uh, you know, that's really what you're talking about, an incredible force multiplier. Um, it, it's exciting and powerful to, uh, to uh, even imagine, you know, the, the impact that this could have. I, I want to kind of go back to basics. Um, when we're talking about this infrastructure gap, um, and nobody's going to argue with that, uh, that, that there's a significant one. Would you be able to unpack for us a little bit, or characterize, I guess, for us, what the nature of that infrastructure gap is? What does it look like? What, what, what kinds of infrastructure, what are the main components that, that are going to be needed uh, to be uh, developed in order to close that gap? So that would be my first question. If you still have time in my time, uh, I'd like to know if you have anything to tell us about this uh, establishment of a First Nations Infrastructure Institute. Thank you. Yep, thank you for the question. So first, first of all, housing. Housing is in, we're, we're in a crisis situation in, in, on our reserves in Canada with housing. So housing would be one of the big ticket items. Um, also roads, uh, water, wastewater uh, would, would be other ones. Um, nursing homes, um, elders centers, um, I'm going to ask Jody here to and uh, Steve to name off a few. Sure. In in a lot of communities, there is a tremendous wait for schools to be built, schools, health, and uh, basic in infrastructure connectivity. Um, I'm from Northern Ontario myself, and oftentimes the lack of connectivity prohibits even young children. Um, Recently, we've come through a pandemic where they could not even attend school online. Uh, if there is a school in their community, um, that's wonderful, but there's a 50-year waiting list to have that school rebuilt. And um, if that is not going to happen in the near future, the children need to be transported off their community or outside of their community. So in addition to what Mr. Daniel said, um, I would certainly advocate for... Um, education, connectivity. Oh. Uh, Probe, just, just, have, just before we a, go on to the yep. next question. A anything on uh, energy infrastructure? Is that yep. also included? Okay. Yep. Do, do I have a couple of minutes to give you an example? Yes. Okay, let, let's, go, let's go reverse. Let's say instead of First Nations needing infrastructure, what if you woke up tomorrow morning and $349.2 billion of infrastructure was removed from the communities in which you live? You would wake up in the morning and you'd hope that the lights would work when you turn on the switch because the diesel generator either is producing energy or it's not. You would go to the bathroom to get ready for work. You hope the water's there. It's probably not clean water in some cases. So you're not drinking it or brushing your teeth. You may be able to have a shower or not. Go downstairs and you find out you want to have breakfast but the table's full because there's not one family living in the house, there's three families living in the house. So you may have got up too late. And then you go say, it's time to go to work. You drive your car, the road's paved, and then it goes to dirt and gravel. It may go back to pave for a little bit, but then it goes to dirt and gravel. And when you eventually get to work, you might realize that the business you thought you worked at doesn't exist 
because businesses don't set up for economic purposes when they don't have reliable energy, when they don't have clean drinking water, and they don't have the infrastructure to make a business go. So we talk about assets and we talk about investment in infrastructure, but think about the economic lack that that happens when you don't have those. Every community in which most of you live, uh, you have sewer, you have water, you take it for granted, but if you didn't have those, how many stores would be there? How many shopping centers? Probably not too many. So if you go in reverse, it kind of gives an impression about what you take for granted, but what others may need. And the Infrastructure the Institute? Institute. Hmm? <clears throat> the Infrastructure Institute is, uh, is part of the next uh, amendments to the uh, First Nations Fiscal Management Act. And so, which we understand there may be an announcement tomorrow. I'm, I'm not quite, I don't have that confirmed yet, but uh, it, uh, it will be a part of the next round of amendments. And so they will be in place to help communities um, get projects, uh, the, the concepts off the ground and uh, to a place where they can actually go and uh, do tendering. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Clark. Sir. Senator <laughs> Levicane Benson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to go out on a limb and just show how little I know about this area, but I feel like some of my colleagues might know as little as I do, so I'm going to ask the question. Um, when I read uh, the information that you sent, I got a letter from you not long ago, and I've been reading your website. It says that, um, that you raise financing through the issuance of debentures in the capital market, and when I further look to see what a debenture is. It says it's a loan certificate backed, an uninsured loan certificate. And so I'm wondering, the, the fact that these are uninsured, does that raise the level of risk? I'm not saying they're not going to be paid back, but the risk to your organization, the risk to the communities, and, and why are they uninsured? Why can't these loans be insured? Uh, actually, great question. The no municipal debenture no provincial debenture and no federal debenture is insured. Yeah. So the reason for that is there are multiple steps you have to take, including the FNFA, before you can go to investors in the capital markets. These are not steps that we've written. These are steps that have been in place since the 1950s, and all parties that want access to investors must accommodate those rules. So the rules are you get what's called a credit rating. Mm -hmm. It's like you would have an audit done. You have an auditor general. A credit rating agency is like an auditor who comes in and tells investors the risks and rewards of lending you money. All issuers have that, provinces, Canada, municipalities. Then you take a look at the revenue streams that back up the loans, and those are rated. In FNFA's case, we leverage provincial agreements, sometimes federal agreements with the First Nations, the provinces have taxing abilities. The federal government has taxing abilities. So the reason we're able to get a credit rating and not need insurance is because the backstops and the safeguards of Canada and the provincial governments support the revenue streams upon which we borrow. Okay. So it is not a private company borrowing. It either exists as a company or it fails as a company. Provinces in Canada are going to be here for a long time. The First Nations are going to be here for a long time. So the revenue streams and the safeguards make insurance not necessary. Great. And just one. Um, so uh, there are uh, bands around where I live. I'm just west of Edmonton who are very wealthy. And I could see them jumping into this opportunity quite quickly. But there are bands that are really quite poor, not that far away. Roads that are completely impassable in the fall and in, in, the, um, in the spring. And I'm wondering, how, does, how is this set up to make sure those bands who maybe need it the most are still able to access these kinds of opportunities? That's, that's, a, that's a, a, another really good question. So the, um, I'm gonna take an example of British Columbia. For, uh, so the, in British Columbia, the provincial government there's revenue sharing of gaming. Mm -hmm. So each First Nation gets a certain portion of it. So they do have monies that they can leverage. Some other provinces don't have that in place. And you're right, the, in, in Alberta, 
there are very wealthy bands. We 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 work with them. Uh, there's 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 a member on our board that's here today. He's he's from a First Nation in Alberta, mm -hmm. and they're into the oil and gas, so so they do have revenues. And there are others that don't. So we, uh, as far as closing the infrastructure gap, I I, I firmly believe that uh, we can work around uh, maybe some authorities mm -hmm. to that would allow us to work with those nations directly because the money's coming would be coming from the federal government. Yeah. It wouldn't be from them. Uh, so the second part of that is building the capacity that's needed and yeah. and the financial management capacity. Yeah. And our sister organization, that's that's their mandate, the First Nations Financial Management Board. And they're looking at the current programs right now with a shared uh, uh, services uh, program that would allow um, those professionals that are needed to uh, help out these these nations um, as, as they work through this. Yeah. Steve or Jody? Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of our board's mandates, and our, our board goes back to 2011 when our act was created on the other revenues was <laughs> do not create halves and those that have less. Fair playing field, one rate for all communities, rural, urban, large, small, one set of rules for all. In most cases, the door is open at our end. Our, lar our largest community has 10,000 members. Our smallest member has 137 members. Mm -hmm. What differentiates sometimes the larger and the smaller is ability to have staff that have the expertise either in the counting area, the finance area, the planning area, areas that provide information to chief and council for decision making. So in some cases, as Ernie has mentioned, the revenue sharing from the provinces aren't what is next door in another province. That's an inhibitor. The other problem is that the staff challenge. So we are trying to work on certain measures where staff can be shared. Mm -hmm. uh, you work for this community part of the week, you work for this community part of the week. Try to build capacity, if you can't do it singular by communities, shared by communities. But that is the challenge to not have some left behind. That's really good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambicane Benson. Senator Sorensen. Uh, thank you. My question has actually been answered, but I will make a comment. Um, first of all, I'm meeting with a group of delegates tomorrow morning at some point, so I'll have another opportunity uh, to discuss this. Um, my previous job was a municipal mayor. And so just to let you know that my philosophy is to borrow now and build now um, while the cost of builds are less than it's going to be uh, down the road, particularly when you're also creating jobs and, uh, and improving the economy. Um, and of course, uh, if interest rates are favorable, uh, I would say to convince my constituents why we were borrowing is it was fiscally irresponsible not to borrow and not to not to build now. Um, so I have, I agree with uh, Senator Arnott, I don't think, certainly no problem for me to agree to signing a letter uh, to support this. I think it's an incredible uh, initiative. Okay, uh, Senator Greenwood, followed by Senator Adet. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, this is not an area that I'm well versed in, so let's say that first. <laughs> so um, I'm really interested because the uh, communities that I've talked to have very um, uh, varied opinions around taxation. And I see that one of your um, mandates or opportunities here is the authority to enact property taxation. Can you tell me a bit about that, um, what that might look like, and what it would be the impact on First Nations communities? So some might do that, some might not do that, like there could be a whole variation across this country. Can you t just tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll give you one example, <coughs> and then uh, Steve can talk about this. Uh, as well, uh, so um, I, I live in the West Bank First Nation Reserve in, in British Columbia. So West Bank First Nation is a self-governing First Nation. They actually generate over $20 million a year in property tax. And this is not from their members. Their members are less than a 1,000. 
is from non-members living on their lands. Um, I'm a First Nation, and but I'm not a member. But I pay property tax to the West Bank First Nation. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there's hundreds of businesses that are located on, on their lands. So that's what it is. It's a property tax f uh, on individuals and, and businesses. And Steve. Yeah. Senator Greenwood, each chief and council makes a decision on the use of their land. Some say the land is ours. You're not coming on it. We're going to keep it for our people. No businesses, no outsiders. There is no property tax system. Others say we're going to use our land for economic development, largely communities that are close to tourist areas, uh, municipalities next door. And they decide to take parts of their land and parcel them out like a municipality would do for construction of neighborhoods, for business licenses, et cetera. But it is a voluntary choice. So we do have some communities that do property taxation on a voluntary choice because it helps support infrastructure needs for their members. And we have a majority of our membership that doesn't do any property tax. It is simply not the use of land that they want, but it is a choice by chief and council with respect. Right. Yeah. Follow up? Thank you for that. I live in Vernon, British Columbia, so I'm not familiar with your territory. Um, I'm wondering, so I understand that, but the communities who are not fortunate enough to have a beautiful lake or, you know, uh, a mall and, and all of those sorts of things, they will never be able to generate the kind of revenue that, say, West Bank does, for example. Um, so when we're talking about haves and have-nots, and I'm probably thinking way down the road, how do we equalize that out? How do we share across these nations? Um, you know, I'm, I think about that because otherwise, if, we, if we're talking haves and have-nots, those who have geographic locales, it's very different across this country. And we think of northern, rural, remote communities that you can't even hardly get to. Um, will they ever have that opportunity? So uh, in, in order for uh, First Nation governments to really uh, advance themselves, they need revenue. You need a revenue stream. And in our case, we... Uh, and I think our sister organization is working on this, the First Nations Tax Commission, is to, they're asking the federal government to share some revenue, whether it's uh, gaming revenue or, it, mm -hmm. or that's from the provinces, but the, um, tobacco, uh, sa tobacco sales, sales tax revenues, those type of things, where you get a steady income of, of revenue, uh, that would really help the First Nation to leverage that. So th it's it's a sharing of revenue, and it's in the un it's in one of the uh, articles in UNDRIP, is that the the state uh, is urged to share uh, revenues with uh, indigenous uh, groups and people. So that's uh, we need that. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a resource tax, whether it's other types of tax that are implemented and put in place or existing. Since you live in the beautiful city of Vernon, you're probably aware that the BC government, and I still don't know if they're the only one or they were the first one that passed UNDRIP also. Yeah. What came out of that was a 20-year agreement where every community, First Nation community in BC, would get a share of a $2 billion program. They would each have a minimum amount of 250000 bumped up by their population, and bumped up further whether they were remote or rural. The monies came from a gaming, uh, Lotto 649, Lotto Max, uh, racetrack betting, et cetera, et cetera, casinos. But once they passed UNDRIP, uh, they then thought that revenue sharing was an obligation and a right and the correct thing to do. Uh, to date, I don't know of another province, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, that's passed UNDRIP, but it was a, but it was a reconciliation in starting to share revenues. Uh, some communities now leverage those amounts they receive under the 20-year sharing agreement with us for some projects, but it's, it's a start. It's not the end result, it's just a start. And as Ernie has said, more revenue sharing is needed because then chiefs and councils can prioritize community needs and have the ability to borrow and leverage to meet those. Thank you. <coughs> 
Okay, quick question before I go to Senator Adet. There are roughly 642 First Nations across Canada. How many work with FNFA and what types of projects? So uh, the First Nations Fiscal Management Act is voluntary. So First Nations actually request to work under, under the act. And it's a process that the, it's an order in council that has to happen. Uh, there are 345 First Nations scheduled under the act. Uh, over 200 of them have actually gone through the financial management board process and have become certified. And there's 150 right now that are working with, with the First Nations Finance Authority. So there's always a lag between the, the three numbers. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, we hope to, we'll have a majority of the First Nations. We have over half now. Mm -hmm. And in what ways do you work with them? Do you have any examples? We, uh, we, we work with them to uh, uh, ass assist at looking what revenues they have available to, to borrow. We also help them uh, uh, look at investment, if they have cash available for investing. We, we do that as well. And uh, we provide advisory services on debt restructuring, um, debt management, those type of things. Oh, okay. So, so for those that uh, worked at, um, on council at a municipality, or at a provincial level, or some level, planning is key. But you can't do planning if you don't know what your capacity to borrow to meet those planning needs are. When a First Nation, and Uri said there's 151 that have completed all the process, there's another 50 waiting to come into the fold. The first step is we, we're not subject to freedom of information, so confidentially we work with them to review their revenue sharing contracts and provide chief and council what's called a borrowing capacity letter. And that letter says, based upon the revenue streams that you have, back off the commitments against those revenue streams, this is the amount of money that you as a community can borrow from FNFA and we stand behind it. When they have that in hand, it's pretty simple process to take a look at your community priorities, the cost of those priorities, and prioritize what you would like to borrow to start meeting them. The problem is, is there are not enough revenues to make the boring capacity large enough to cover all the needs, and that's why the infrastructure gap is there. But, uh, so what, we've, we've, we've done schools, uh, we've done health centers, we've done communities that now have hydro projects, wind farms, solar projects, we've done elders care centers, youth centers, administrative centers, multi-purpose centers, uh, everything that you would say that's a necessary for a community. We've done housing, uh, and that is, is stuff you would recognize. It's just simply not enough own source revenues to bring the gap down. It's growing, it's not falling. Mr. Chair, yep. if I might add, uh, a couple of senators have mentioned have and have not, and the foundation of this regime has really been to focus on building capacity within our First Nations across Canada. One of the things that we heard from our nations while we were uh, creating this piece of legislation was that we need to increase the capacity. We don't want people coming into the nation, doing work and just leaving. We want to learn. We want to have the ability to manage our own finances and uh, allow for um, autonomy. Through this piece of legislation and the institutions, we have become the most sec uh, the most successful sectoral governance agreement in Canada to date. We work with the nations to build capacity, and it doesn't matter the size of their communities. So we have a number of communities that uh, vary in size, as Mr. Berna had mentioned, and we work with them to increase uh, both their governance processes and policies, as well as increase and work with them to um, improve their financial rigor. So we talk about safeguards that we have in place. Uh, so this is not just a regime for the communities that uh, happen to be situated uh, adjacent to um, a winery or these beautiful places. We certainly have a lot of smaller, more remote communities who have benefited greatly uh, from using this, this regime. This can allow communities to move forward by doing things like coming off of diesel and participating in renewable energy uh, projects, uh, which also benefit the communities greatly. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Senator Odette. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chairman. So I'll have you do a little exercise uh, right now as we're speaking in Gatineau and Anishinaabe uh, territory. We have the chiefs of the uh, various nations and most mayors and uh, municipalities of Quebec. For three years, we've been discussing economic reconciliation. And to my mind, this means uh, economic security. And we want to get out from under uh, our, our tutorship with the federal government. So uh, for those who have less capacity than others, uh, such as my nation, magnificent, uh, but we're going to have a project where we have people who will come and see what it is. We, we have uh, citizens of our nation which are going to benefit but it's not Inu that are going to be working in all areas. It's going to be the wealth of the nation, Quebec or Canada. We don't have the expertise right now. Could you explain uh, the uh, relationships you have with universities or colleges or other institutions of learning to uh, provide this uh, new generation? And I want to of course, uh, recognize and congratulate the women that are on your board. <laughs> a really important question. Uh, the the First, Nation, First Nation Finance Authority, uh, that's, that's, that is not in our mandate at this point in time, but our sister, it's in our sister uh, institution's mandate, the First Nations Financial Management Board. Mm -hmm. And in the previous life, I was actually president and CEO of the First Nation, uh, of the Aboriginal Finance Officers Association, a very successful uh, not-for-profit organization. And uh, that, that was the mandate of that organization, was to build up the capacity of the individual uh, Aboriginal finance manager. And it's, it's been a very successful program to date. We encourage and we talk to our communities uh, uh, about all kinds of uh, capacity issues and we recommend certain things. Uh, we tried ourselves to provide advice on, uh, as I mentioned before, debt restructuring because we don't want to see a First Nation over leverage. It, it's, it's not a good thing for them. It's not a, not a good thing for us as well and, uh, and, and for their membership in, in general. So uh, I'm gonna ask Jody to speak about that. Uh, Jody and I worked together at the AFOA and uh, we're still working together today, so uh, we enjoyed our company. <laughs> thank you, Ronnie. Uh, and thank you for the question, uh, Senator Odette. Um, we strongly believe and encourage uh, continued education and, and one of the processes that we continue to encourage our communities is to achieve uh, a certain level of certification uh, through our sister institution, uh, which continuously improves the outcomes of, of the nation. We also believe in providing autonomy and power back to the nation and allowing chief and council to make those decisions for its communities as opposed to mandating uh, what we think um, they should do. I think that many of our communities have experienced that for many, many years and um, our approach is really to return that self-determination and autonomy back to the community. So we will happily support and we encourage them to attain those certifications, but we don't prescribe them um, or mandate them. Uh, we allow the Chief and Council to decide which, which is best for their own community members. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, De Senator Tannis. Thanks, Chair. Nice to see you. Um, let me just start by saying uh, that y you and uh, First Nations uh, Financial Management Board, I think, are the vanguard of the new wave of Indigenous-led institutions. The more we can get Indigenous-led institutions in place in all of the key areas, and, we're, and every meeting it seems like we're talking to somebody that is talking about what we really need in this space, just our last meeting is an indigenous-led institution that will deal, uh, provide resources and expertise and all of the common things that all other governments have for First Nations governments as they work 
uh, in their own communities to deal with things. So, con you know, I want I want to congratulate you, and and I know you know that I'm a huge supporter of uh, of your organization. And I I'd just like to double check on a few things, and maybe there's a lot of new people here. Um, I I've, I've been on the on the um, committee for 10 years, and I remember us here and over coffee talking about if only we could get a generous government in place, uh, boy, what could we do? And uh, here we are a number of years later, um, and, and there's, there's opportunities, right? Uh, and we've come a long way, but there's a, a lot further we could go. But let me just take it one step at a time. So my understanding, and you can confirm this, or, or tell me it's changed, is that really the first step in accessing public investors uh, and issuing bonds is to be certi certified by the First Nations Financial Management Board. And the certification process involves governance, uh, you know, looking at the governments, uh, governance of a community uh, in addition to its fiscal management practices and whether they're formal, informal, whether they're weak or strong, um, and that all of that process takes place and they either are certified or they're presented with a list of deficiencies that they need to go away and fix. And you'll, and in many cases, uh, the, the board will help them fix it. That's, that's all still the program, right? Yeah, that's, that's and, correct. and then they come to you and you do your assessment just like bankers do where they would say if a, a couple was going in to buy a house, you work backwards. How much extra money do you have beyond your obligations? And how much then could that mean in terms of monthly payments that then drive out a number that you could borrow. And, and you've gone, in the time I've been here, from 100 million, and, and that sounded astronomical, to 2 billion. That's great. Um, and, and what you really are looking at when you're looking at the capacity of a community is what revenue streams do they have outside of core funding? You're not saying, you know, you're going to take your, your education money and you're going to take a piece of that and borrow and, and hive that off on an annual basis for the next 30 years in order to pay for something. This is outside of core funding, and it is what we used to call, or I always heard it called, own source revenue, right? And that could be gaming revenue where it's shared, or if you've got your own gaming facilities, it could be tobacco, it could be um, resource revenue sharing. If we can get resource development going again, uh, it could be resource revenue sharing. Uh, if we were really fair-minded, it would be resource revenue sharing of resources that are already approved and being monetized as we speak, right? Um, property tax for those that have some ability to, uh, to attract people to come and live in the area, like West Bank, man, I, I uh, took my family to Lake Oga, the shores of Lake Okanagan and, uh, and many, many times. Um, uh, enjoyed uh, everything there was in West Bank. Uh, but as somebody said, not everybody has that. Um, and all of that is still the case. Yes. What you're now proposing is, and we've talked about this as I remember, as a way to take a miserly amount of annual capital budget and say, how can we in this age of low interest rates carve out a portion of that and you commit annually to that amount to make the payments, right? So that we would be actually taking the government's money now and adding it to own source revenue. The, the question I've got is twofold. So when we do that, there's a commitment that goes on for a, a really long time. It outlasts any other government, right? Any government. So it becomes an obligation that has to go beyond the mandate of a government. And so if there was a cut that needed to happen in capital spending, they would still have to make that amount. And theoretically, you could cut all the way down to zero if we really you know, got going because we'd say, well, we can't really cut to zero on anything because we've got all these payments for the next uh, 30 years that we said we were going to make on behalf of, of folks. Uh, that needed something now and we're going to borrow the money. Um, and I can see a situation where non-certified <coughs> folks start saying, well, 
okay, so now the pool for me and us, because we, we've chosen not to be certified and not to borrow the money, the capital budget is now less because of this. How do you reconcile that? Because we, we talked about this before where we would say, look, spend, your capital spend is $2 billion. Drop it to 1.8 and go allocate that and give $200 million in a program to support borrowing, as you said, because it will help. And, and what I thought we were going to do with it was invest it in money-making projects to some degree so that own source revenue got developed. We're now on infrastructure, um, which is dead money, right? It's dead spending, right? Although housing, um, there's rents, but not everybody pays rents. We've heard that there's lots of communities where the people believe that the community needs to provide housing and that it's a treaty right that they not pay rent. So, so that's not always going to be the case. So, so how do you... How do you answer that question of are we grinding against that budget with a risk that we're actually excluding the people who need it the most? As opposed to the idea of generating own source revenue where at some point you start making your own payments because you've created some infrastructure that would make the payments or, or you've created some, some project that's going to that's going to help make the payments. Just could, could you cover that a little bit for me? Yeah. <coughs> okay, I'll start out. Such I'll a windy the, question. Yeah. Okay. So, really good question. Uh, one we, one we get asked a lot, and uh, so in order to for First Nations to generate wealth, create economic, act, they need a revenue stream. So that's. That, that's got to be the starting point. And so not all First Nations have that ability. So creating those economic development opportunities in some areas is going to be very difficult. Um, and hence, that's, that's why we were talking about a revenue sharing approach um, through, through whatever means. In, in the last uh, budget, um, not the last, uh, this two budgets uh, ago, um, it was... Uh, allowed, they made provision to allow uh, First Nations to use the GST rebates as a revenue source to leverage money. Uh, before it wasn't allowed because, you know, the uh, GST was at 7%, it went to 5 <clears throat> And if uh, future governments ever decided to lower it or raise it, then you got a problem. If, if you got debt outstanding and uh, you don't have enough revenues to support that. So, so that's available now. So every First Nation has the opportunity to establish a First Nation GST regime. So what we need is more of those types of revenues so that uh, First Nations have a steady source of revenue that they can rely on to leverage to get into those economic activities and to generate uh, re uh, uh, revenues that they can actually uh, start uh, building infrastructure. That's what's going on right now uh, with First Nations that we've lent money to. Those ones that have the ability are using that to uh, build infrastructure. Um, the, the other, uh, the other, one other source of revenue is that in different provinces there are opportunities to do green energy projects and provincial governments have long-term contracts with these, uh, these First Nations. And they generate revenues, additional revenues, which they're actually plow plowing back into infrastructure. And either it's a daycare center, yeah. an elders complex, or, 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 or whatever. So I hope I'm not uh, getting off, t uh, off the, your, 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 your question. And, uh, and you know, one of the things that I firmly believe in is that um, a precursor to economic development is infrastructure. We need infrastructure in place, whether it's tourism, whether it's uh, anything else where First Nation needs to generate revenue. You take Member 2, for instance. They, built, they actually managed to build a, a road. There was a ring road that used to go around their 
their uh, First Nation and they managed to build a highway overpass and build a road to their community, which made less time to get to hospitals, even for the community of Sydney. And so, remember too, was they built infrastructure on that road, like uh, for doctor's offices and, and other things. And so that's an example of a First Nation um, using revenues that they had from a revenue sharing uh, agreement uh, through gaming to create these opportunities. And so that's, that's, what, that's what needs to happen. There needs to be a revenue stream in order to happen, that to happen. So in the infrastructure gap, a lot of First Nations, because it's such a large number, it's, it's, it's dead money, like you say. And, you know, the federal government can't possibly close this gap right now without some sort of solution. And so that's why we're here. We're, th there needs to be federal government money in, in, involved in uh, trying to close this infrastructure gap and monetizing it. And to ensure that First Nations that the have-nots participate, th we need to look at other mechanisms within the government, uh, how it operates in, in this structured funding environment um, to allow those type of things to happen. Whether it's authorities that kind of allow us to do that, to work directly with those nations. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Tanis. I'm going to go to Senator Hartling for the last question. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you for being here and uh, for all the guests that are here too. It's nice to see such a wonderful crowd of people. And I wanna say that your, your expertise, your leadership, and uh, your commitment to this is very, very impressive and certainly have my support. Um, I really liked, when Steve, when you brought us into the reality of what would it be like for us and, you know, thinking about waking up without water, without uh, getting to work, certain things, uh, all of those things, heat, for us, when we have a power outage in Atlantic Canada for a day, we can hardly cope with it. So I can't imagine living day to day because that's very, very <coughs> stressful. And so I also was appreciating that you're saying that you have people at the ready to do some work, to do the building. Because a lot of places now, we don't have that labor to do those kind of things. So y it sounds like you're ready and you're planning. And, and I really appreciate all the various um, infrastructure that you mentioned. You, you, together you've talked about from schools to housing to nursing homes and water and even the internet for the children not to have that for the school so I guess you know money is definitely essential here but I want to ask you what would be the impacts or what are the impacts on the people when they don't have their needs met what's happening to the people because you're bringing us hope here with something that can change this but what are those impacts um, well, I'll start out and I'll get uh, Jody to finish off the, the social impacts would be just, it would be tenfold in what we're facing today. Um, so there, there's overcrowding in, in houses. Um, there, there's just, like I, I, I can't imagine that, uh, that, that happening myself. Uh, I'm lucky, I live on a good reserve that provides all of that. And uh, I know we had a power outage because uh, they were changing some electrical things. It, it was difficult to to, to actually live in in, the, in that with that uh, not available that they take it granted for every day. And so, to me, the right now our communities are facing such social impacts as a result of a, of the uh, lack of inf infra modern infrastructure, housing, water, you name it, uh, health services. Uh, um, it, it, it's, it's, we, we see it right now, it, it's here, it, it's every day. Um, in education, we have low, low uh, graduation rates um, that puts our, our kids behind. Um, and yeah, so I'll ask Jody to add, add on to that. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, I spoke earlier about um, children not having the ability to attend school. Uh, recently, as I mentioned, uh, we've come through a pandemic where for um, over a year, a lot of our children were forced to attend classes online. In some of our communities, our children did not have the ability to attend classes, so they, by default, fell behind um, in, a, in a world that where they're already struggling. If we talk about from a health um, perspective, 
you and I have uh, clean drinking water right in front of us, and uh, families don't always have that. I recently uh, spoke with a woman who lived in a three-bedroom bungalow, but there was 27 people living in that home. So having access, and not having access to clean drinking water, that means laundry can't be done, linens can't be done, things that we take for granted on a regular basis. And that leads to other health challenges. Um, we're talking about um, mold-infested homes where breathing and asthma uh, become the reality in a lot of people's lives. And um, quite honestly, this is, you mentioned it, Senator, this is about hope, creating hope and showing our children that there is um, a lot of hope uh, that exists and we can create beautiful things for our community. And uh, we believe that we have a very sustainable solution where we can now offer uh, a hand to the federal government to help close this gap. So we are, um, we're confident in our ability to execute um, how we can provide loans and build infrastructure, uh, allow our own people to uh, talk about um, the types of things that they would like to see in their communities as opposed to being told what they need in their communities. We believe that's a very powerful tool. And um, earlier in a meeting today, you know, I, I heard that uh, when we have our people uh, employed and having the ability to build these homes, if you're building your auntie's home, you're going to do a, a really incredible job to make sure she has the best, the very best, and a good job is done. And we take pride in the things that we do, the schools that we build that reflect our culture. So um, when we don't have these things, it's a constant state of, you know, not feeling like uh, we're deserving. Uh, when in fact we are, and uh, our communities, our elders uh, deserve the very best. Our children deserve the very best, not just today, but for generations to come. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could just um, clarify, if you kindly give us a support letter, what we're talking about is not pulling money out of the current capital budget. We're asking for a new line in the budget that would complement the current $2 billion, not take away from it. So it is not, we're not gonna create problems. We're asking for a new line in the budget that can be amended going forward, but it will add to the existing amount there, not, not, not take away and harm. Thank you for that. Okay, time for this panel is now complete. I wish to thank our witnesses for testifying this evening and we'll briefly suspend now so we can go in camera. <laughs>